This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not dispense medical advice. Always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified health providers if you have any questions regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking such advice because of something you have heard on this podcast. Hello, everyone, and thanks again for listening to Prostate Cancer Real Talk. This is Shay. And today we have an amazing show for you. Today we're going to talk to Dr. Francis. Dr. Francis is a relationship therapist, counselor. And the show today was so amazing. I actually had a therapy session myself that I really didn't even know I needed. Uh, We talked about the emotions that one will experience with being diagnosed with prostate cancer. And it's not even just about the guy, but also the spouse. I hope that you really enjoy the interview that we did today with Dr. Francis. Welcome to Prostate Cancer Real Talk. Did you know that one out of every eight U.S. men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during his lifetime? One out of eight. And black men are 50% more likely to develop prostate cancer in their lifetime and twice as likely to die from the disease. But we're not here to quote statistics and tell you how tough prostate cancer can be. Rather, we are here to create a supportive community of survivors, a place where we can discuss the real-life coping methods from the perspective of a married couple who are living through it day by day. This is Prostate Cancer Real Talk, how prostate cancer can affect state of mind and relationships. This week, we will be discussing the mental and sociological challenges for the patient, the spouse, family, and friends, and their coping tools. We're delighted to welcome to our podcast, Dr. Kitson Francis. He's the founder and CEO of Family Consult and Counseling Service in Huntsville, Alabama. He provides counseling and interventions for families, individuals, married couples, substance abuse, grief counseling, medical illness, and more. Dr. Francis works closely with his clients in a warm, personal, and totally hands-on manner. He's very unique because he works individually with the client. From system intake through resolution and frequently includes free follow-up sessions as a part of his service. Dr. Francis gained national recognition as the marriage counselor on the reality OWN Network's reality TV show, Love and Marriage Huntsville. For more information on reaching Dr. Francis, visit our website prostatecancerrealtalk.com. Thank you very much, Dennis, for that great introduction and welcome to our podcast. So, you know, Shay and I, obviously, we, we, we saw you on the show that Dennis just mentioned. And as we put this podcast together, we thought it would be a great idea to get your perspective on relationships, particularly on the subject of people who are facing, uh, uh, couples who are facing prostate cancer. So with that, you know, you and I have talked a little bit before the show, and I'd like for you to give us your opening comments, your thoughts, you know, anything you'd like to say on this particular subject. All right. Again, I just want to thank you so much for this uh, invitation to be on your podcast. Um, well, let, let me just frame this. And I'm a man of faith. Let me say that. I don't know about you. Yes. And I don't know about, about your people, the people that, that, that will frequent your podcast. So I just want to set, set a, a scene here for you when it comes down to couples and and whatever happens with with them. So so at the end of uh, creation week, God uh, on the sixth day, what he did was he created Adam and he, you know create all the animals. And then what he did was, fast forward, he put Adam to sleep, the first anesthesiologist, the first anesthesia that was that, that was ever done, put him to sleep, he took a rib out of his side, put him, put him back up, no scars, no nothing. And then he brings this beautiful woman to him. And he looks at her and he says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. God didn't tell him where he got her from. He just slipped at her and just said, bone in my bone. And with that, there is this piece that comes into my mind. He says, well, if that's the paradigm of marriage, because that was the first marriage, 
if that is the paradigm and he can say, listen, she's bone in my bone, flesh in my flesh, then what I'm saying here is this, that marriages today should look at that and say, my wife, Marlo, is the other part of me, not peace, but the other part of me that lives outside of me. I am the other part of her that lives outside of her. If we embrace that, then everything that I'm going through, biopsychosocial, she should be sharing going through that. Because if I'm going through something, if I'm going through something, okay, I am what I call the symptom bearer. Because she's the other part of me that lives outside of me, she then becomes a symptom sharer. I carry her. But because of the but because of our love for each other, she shared. I just want to say this that, that you know, whatever it is that, that are happening to couples out there, whatever is going on with one couple, one part of the part that's living outside of the other, if they truly embrace the symptom sharer and the symptom bearer motif that I'm putting out there, then then what there is this amazing supportive network that they develop where they carry each other and they share with each other and they bear with each other and they support each other. And I, I think that's, I, personally, I think that that is a really good uh, a metaphor because I use that a lot in my sessions with with um with clients whatever they they come they bring in you know so just a reminder to ensure that you stay up to date on the latest episodes from PCRT don't forget to hit that subscribe and like button well you know during some of our uh discussions as we met and we planned uh for the show you did mention to me that you know one of the things that you do in your in your profession uh, of counseling is to help people get through like illnesses and, and, and things of that nature. And on the frame of, you know, in, in, in the scope of what you just said, one of the great things that, that I can share is that the support mechanism that Shay gave me was incredibly strong. And it, it brought to my mind that support mechanism, uh, that symptom sharer uh, that, you, that you just mentioned. So as we talk about people, couples who have got this diagnosis of prostate cancer, what can you say about, you know, the psychological and the mental uh, exercises or the mental uh, experience that people go through when they get news like that? And what are your thoughts and recommendations on how they can deal with them more effectively? Okay. Now, of course, um, if you didn't suspect that you had this, if a person didn't think they had this, when they go to the doctor and the doctor calls them in and say, listen, this is what's going on. You know, you have prostate cancer. Now, there are, if you go down through Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's uh, uh, progression, the first one is denial. Oh, no, no I don't believe this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> In, in, in the denial is, a, is an attempt to protect the self from having to deal with the reality. So, so, you go, so, we, so they go through the, through the denial part and then, and then there, after you go through that kind of soul too, then there's this kind of anger. And the anger could be based on a number of things internally and externally, so, you know, which, you know, socially. There is, you, you go through stuff like, uh, like, like, uh, like bargaining, you know, you know, you start to bargain with, listen, with, with God or with yourself or your higher power, to your spirit. You know, say, well, listen, well, the part of bargaining is, what can I do to change my lifestyle? That's a part of the bargaining process. What can I do? What have I done? How did I get this? Is this thing hereditary, you know? And if it is, you know, I'm not going to give up. So how am I going to... Um, a part of my bargaining process is change my lifestyle. There's a lot of things you have to change when you change your lifestyle, y'all. 
But the first thing about changing your lifestyle is this. You have to change your view of yourself. I'll, talk, I'll, I'll probably talk about that a little bit more too. So, so you change this lifestyle. It's part of bargaining process. And then, you, you know, and then there's the anger, you know, come here, man. And, and, then, and then there's the acceptance. And what happens here is this, you have to come, you come to the conclusion that there is an unwelcomed guest in your life. You didn't raise your hands for it. You don't want it. And this is what I call have but don't want. We all have things in our lives that we have but don't want. You have, we have to battle with those things. And just because we have something that we don't want, it doesn't mean it's going to get up and go away. It doesn't mean that we have, you know, this answer like right now to that. So we have to, you know, go not we're talking like this you know that's an existential stuff my existence is at stake like right now have but don't want where did i get it how do, how do i how do i mitigate it? how do i get rid of this how will this thing i have but don't want how will it change me the bearer the bearer the bearer the symptom bearer how will it change me so i get this mirror this mirror you know and i you, you know like and I actually use a mirror when, when, I, when I do therapy with, with my client. I say, you look in this mirror. When they look in the mirror, what they see is this person looking back at them. But I say to them, you are looking at a person. Have you looked into the person? Have you been able to look into the person? A lot of people are not able to look into the person because what you see on the inside of what they see on the inside is really not that pretty. And that might be something coming from childhood, their view of themselves, their picture of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when they begin to go, go through all of this, so, so as, as they, as they get to, they go down through this, this whole bargaining piece and they can vastly they can go back and forth. They can go from one step and jump forward. They, they, they can camp out in one for a long time. All that stuff. But let me just say this, that when you go to, when this happens, it changes your view of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. It really does. You begin to see yourself as different. If this is something that society has a problem with, you know, this disease, Sometimes what society will do, and you got to be careful that you don't do this, and that is you will see yourself as prostate cancer as opposed to having prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And some people can't make the difference because they think that if I have it, then that's who I am. And nothing could be further from the truth. So when, so when people are not able to get beyond that, they buy into whatever social stigma is out there. And what that does, it tends to stop you from, it kind of governs the, the, the degree to which you are willing to go out and socialize. So now it, it impacts your socialization with people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it really does impact your socialization. So, so, so you have to ask yourself, if I decide that I don't want to go out there and talk about this thing with people, yeah, so, so, so how you doing, man? Okay. I don't want to lie and tell them I'm fine. You know? <laughs> so, right. I don't want to lie and tell them I'm fine. I just don't go around them anymore. Hmm. That cuts me off because I love to be around people, but because I need to defend myself against a stigma that that, 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 that I, I don't like. And if they find out, then maybe they will, maybe they, they will abandon me like I am abandoning myself. Okay. Okay. You know I mean, right? Absolutely. And it reminds me of it kind of limits, it kind of limits my social interaction with people. Let me stop at that and then we I'm sure we okay. develop some other things as we go through this. Thing. Okay. Okay. Well, just you know, as you mentioned that, it it reminds me of the experience that I had when Shay came up with the idea for this podcast, it took me a while uh, to come to the point where 
I, I, for lack of a better term, I call it built up the courage. If you and you, you know, and your husband, you know, have this wonderful marriage, it's not that you have a wonderful marriage. Here's what you have: you have a wonderful interpersonal relationship. People walk around saying they have a bad marriage, and I tell people, I say, leave your marriage alone. Ain't nothing wrong with it. What you have, and I won't go into all that, but what you have is a good interpersonal relationship, which is very supportive and validating and all this kind of stuff. And the degree to which, when you get married, the degree to which a part of your ongoing development on your journey, okay, resides in the other person, and you need the other person to be a particular way so that you can achieve your particular goal. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yes. When that person, whenever there's a change in that person, there is a change in you because now the change in that person might stop you from achieving your own particular goal. And so now the conflict is, how do I take care of me while taking care of him? Because I need to take care of him so I can get to take care of me. And so and in all of this, there is this ongoing bonding. And I think one of the things when you say, listen, I'm, I'm going to give him all the garlic he can eat. I think what, what, what you're trying to do is say, listen, here's the word. I am facing a major loss. The symptom bearer and the symptom sharer are so closely connected like this. And when anything happens to him, it happens to me because I need him to be in a to be able to do some things for me so that I can enjoy my life the way I want to enjoy it. And so now this interdependency that you had, it's been wrecked and railroaded. Yeah. You got me, right? Yes. Because of this, and I'm going to call it this intruder. Yes. Okay. Because of this intruder. So now you have to deal with not only the, not only the loss in your husband, but now you have to deal with your own personal interdynamic loss that you're going to go through because there are some things that just won't happen now because of the loss. You know, biologically, a lot of things won't happen. Sociologically, things won't happen. Okay. Psychologically, emotions and thoughts, a lot of things won't happen. And, and, and you got to be very careful. So now I'm talking to the other set of people. You got to be very careful because what what could happen is that those things could come in and create a separation between an ongoing distancing in the relationship, and it leads to going back to this. If there's an ongoing distancing in the relationship, and if I have a need, if I have a need that I just have to satisfy, I might leave the marriage and go get satisfied somewhere else. You understand what I'm saying, right? Don't do that, honey. Don't do that. <laughs> That's not me. That's not, we're past that. That's not us. No, no, no. no I'm not talking, you're not talking about the other people oh, out there. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm talking about the other people out there now who might be listening. Because this this stuff is real. Yeah, right. it is. Because, because you you know, you know, I just said H, B, uh, have the D, W. You know, we said that, right? Right. Well, right. there's another part to that. It's WBDH, want but don't have. Mm -hmm. So when things happen to your husband and there are things that he can't do, cut the grass, have sex, whatever, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. And you want him to do that. You have a want but don't have. Why? Because the, because the person who fulfills that want but don't have vacuum inside of you is this man over here who can't function the way you want him to function. Therefore, you go through your loss of want but don't have. What happens to me if I just can't do without this thing that I want but don't have? Now you have a battle within yourself. Now, how does one get past that? I mean, we're, thank God, on the other side of that, but I'm sure that there are people that, you know, the struggle is much longer, you know, yeah. because this process, the recovery can be from anywhere two weeks to like 16 months or so. And that could probably be challenging, but thank God we're on the other side, but having gone through it, I know it could probably be challenging. 
so 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 we have these, these people a lot, a lot of people are not willing to commit right to the interpersonal relationship here is what they're willing to commit to they're willing to to commit to what they can get to fulfill their own needs in the relationship or through the relationship for those people, the marital relationship becomes more tenuous. It's not as robust. You, you understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so now, so now you can have all these uh, difficulties that's creeping in. But one of the things that they really need to understand, though, is this, that there are families involved. Right. There are families from, listen, children that you have, and then there are extended families, and then there are families of origin, okay, and then there are belief systems, and then there are no-nos, and then there are yes, yes, this is what we do. And there, and so you're, you're confronted with all of these things, all right? People are confronted. And then you said something. If this, let's say it wasn't, let's say it's not uh, prostate cancer, okay, but this is a lifestyle that somebody had or develop that the spouse was saying, don't do that. Don't do that. This is going to happen. Don't do that. This could happen. And then it happens. Right. Then it happens. Right. Mm -hmm. After the spouse is saying, don't, 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 don't. Then it happens. So now that it happens, it shakes their world. Their world is changed. And because their world, their internal world is changed, their intrapersonal world is changed. A lot of dissatisfaction. Guess what? A lot of anger, a lot of acting out of anger, a lot of distancing, all this kind of stuff, you know, can, can happen. You know, you know, and so, like I said, when that happens at the dyad level, the, 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 the husband and wife at that dyadic level, if you have children, it will change your behavior. And when your behavior changes, it changes, it impacts everybody in the system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everybody in the system. So those things are not private anymore. You know, your your emotions not private anymore. You can hide behind a mask if you want to. You can do that. But here is where you can't hide. And I call this my two I call this the two o'clock moment. So imagine if you will, like two o'clock in, in, in the morning, you know, the house is quiet. Nothing is on. It's dark. And I'm and I'm laying down beside my wife in bed and I hear it. <sighs> I hear her sleeping. Yeah. My eyes are wide open. And I got things on my mind. This one thing that just won't leave me. And it's consuming my time. I want to sleep, but this thing won't let me sleep. So here I am, word, you know, just thinking and thinking and thinking. I wish I could kind of sleep away. Just thinking and thinking and thinking. And won't go. So that two o'clock moment, it consumes me so much. I wake up in the morning, so I'm tired. All kind of stuff happens. Just a reminder, to ensure that you stay up to date on the latest episodes from PCRT, don't forget to hit that subscribe and like button. But but, the, but but in this interpersonal relationship piece, because you can't get what you want, you're in this have but don't want state. What you do about it could convert the anger you have towards your spouse. And what you do about it might create some, in terms of your behavior, might create some guilt. Mm-hmm. You deal with your guilt by saying, but if he had listened or if she had listened, I wouldn't be going through this, so I don't feel so guilty. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I, I want to make it clear one point uh, that we kind of brought up earlier, and that is prostate cancer isn't necessarily a result of a lifestyle right. that someone chose. Right. Uh, it, it's right. just, you know, it's it's sort of like getting, you know, Hit, hit by a friendly fire, okay? Or, but you know, it's just something that it's just something that happens. And you know, as as the we talked about in our opening, when when uh, Dennis opened the show, he said, you know, like one out of eight men uh, are going to experience prostate cancer sometime in their life, and for black men, it's even higher. Right. So, so black men have a uh, higher uh, propensity for the disease, right. and it's more deadly 
okay, what's, what's, a, what's, you know, we're diagnosed with it. What I'd like to, to ask you to talk about is s- some of the positive things that people can do. So let's suppose you have a couple who's facing this um, and, you know, we're not equipped for this stuff. I mean, we're not equipped to handle this stuff, you know, uh, all the time. Of course, you know, as you mentioned, we're people of faith, but what are some of the things other than prayer, uh, some of the practical things that we can do on a day-to-day basis? My God, I just got this diagnosis from my doctor. How do I tell my wife? I had to build up my courage. It took me a couple of weeks, uh, you know, to, to tell her that I got, I told a friend uh, and I waited to tell my friend after I had gone through the surgery, after I had gone back to the doctor for the post-surgical checkup and everything was clear, I was in good shape. And then I told him and he still started crying. Okay. After I told him. So what are some of the coping mechanisms that we can use as we face this with our spouse or with our friends and our family. Okay. So let me say this. I, um, I went to my doctor and, you know, my A1C was kind of a, you know, they, they, they say it was good, but, but some of the other things just wasn't, just wasn't jiving, you know? So I went and I did a bone marrow and I did all kinds of stuff like that. You know so my wife, she is a nurse practitioner. So what do I do? I'm coming home. I'm telling her. She's asking, "Did you get? Did you get your your your, your results from the doctor?" I say, "Yeah." She's, and and, I, and you, she wants to see it because she understands that stuff. So one of the coping mechanisms then is this: that all of my medical history is wide open to my spouse. When I go to the doctor for those kind of tests, she comes with me. She don't come to necessarily drawing blood, but when I have to go talk to the doctor, she's right there with me. She asks questions that I don't know how to ask. What am I doing? I'm saying to her that I depend on you to help me through this. Why? I'm going to go back to the reason because I have to depend on her because she is the other. Oh, man, I'm going to tell you something. When it comes down to marriage, if you could just see your spouse, take this away. If you could just see your spouse as the other part of you that lives outside of you and without that other part of you being as well as you want the other part to be, you can't be well. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I treat this as, and I really do take it like this, the symptom bearer needs a symptom sharer to be there. So let me tell you how that works. Listen, if I broke my leg, God forbid, when I did, I broke my foot one time and went to the hospital and they gave me crutches. Those crutches was as much an important part of my ability to ambulate and move as anything else. And so therefore, I wouldn't. I wasn't go, gonna go anywhere without my crutches. So therefore, it became a part of me. So when when I see my wife as a part of me, I have to share that. Now, the other thing too that that is that is really necessary is to develop a good supportive relationship. Not because something happened, but just because you need to have a good supportive relationship so that when something happens that person is available to you. When something happens, yes. she takes she takes on everything about me except my pain. She can't feel my pain, but everything else, she can take that on. Preach. You know, mm-hmm. she can take that, make, make, you know, make that a part of herself. Now, here's what happens. What else I need to do? Do more things together. You just... Dis- other parts of yourselves when you start doing more things together. And unfortunately, these are some of the sicknesses, illness that bring some people closer together. You know why? Because there's this little word we call dependency. Dependency, the degree to which one is dependent on the other. So now we have interdependency. That interdependency is now shaken. It can get either stronger by, 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 by this 
whatever it is, or it can pull each other apart if the other person goes into shock and denial and say, man, and, and having a sense of hopelessness, I can't help this, I can't do this, I didn't sign up for this, all these kinds of things. But then, but, but you know, that's, but do more together. This, I think, you know, you pray together. You certainly take take a look at your lifestyle, whatever the lifestyle, you know, you know, there are three things, three main areas that I talk about lifestyle. Do these things together. It's called R-A-M, RAM, R-A-M. It's rest. Make sure you get plenty of rest. You know, spend more time with each other resting in, in, instead of the TV, okay? You know, uh, and then, um, no, 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 not, not R-A-M, sorry, that's another one. It's R-E-D, rest. E stands for exercise. You'd be surprised how much exercise can actually prolong your life after it has been prescribed on you to die over a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. Good exercise can do that. Your regular exercise can do that. You know, so are we, and then, and then your diet. You know, what do you eat? When do you eat? How much of it do you eat? Some, you know, these things, Really, those are three of the most important things that people can do. And when you do this together, and it's, you know, I, I, I will say to people, the other part of you are, is not feeling well. How are you feeling knowing that the other part of you over here is not feeling well? What can you, and here's what I say, what can you do inside of you to incite change in the other part of you that's outside of you, <laughs> you know? So in other words, taking responsibility for, I am only as well as I as my other part. So doing these things, finding more things to do together, pray more, work out more, eat right, talk right, be supportive of each other, share with each other. Why? Because when you do that, the other person just don't feel so at all. Right. So Dr. Francis, so, when L was diagnosed, yes. I didn't have anger, but I had a tremendous amount of sadness for him. So is, was that like inappropriate? I don't, well, maybe because I, I guess you can't say what's appropriate for an individual, but that was my emotion. That was yours? Yes. Okay. Yes. So you just said something. When L was diagnosed, I had... A lot of um, what do you say was it anger? Sad, no, no sadness. So like I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure some people with the diagnosis probably, you know, go through anger. Yeah, that yeah. was not me. For right. me, it was sadness, not for myself, but for him because okay. he's such an active person. You know, uh -huh. very sociable, exercise, just uh, a person that loves life, and right. you know, and and so for me, immediately I was kind of thinking like that all was going to change for him. So I just had this tremendous level of sadness for him, not okay. for myself, but just that his life could potentially change. Okay. All right. So, so, so your wife had this, uh, this uh, sadness, you know, for you. And then she says, your life could potentially change, but her sadness was for you. So I'm going to go back to and say this, you know, Shay, that, your sadness was as much for you as it was for your husband. But here's what you did. In order to not having to face the trauma of the sadness, here's what she did. Al. She project, she transferred some of her some of her sadness onto you. And then she could she could really and she could get into her rescuing mode, okay? She could begin to do all the things she wanted to do to help you to get feel better and to make sure you're happy and to make sure you're not sad and you know buy you all these things and let's go for a walk and I bought your favorite dessert all these kind of things so that you are not looking sad because when you look sad she feels sad but she try to mask it so she don't look sad so you don't look sad. Yep. Yep. Did I, did I, did I, did yeah. Did I? Did I? That was it. That was it. That was it. <laughs> yep. That was it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That yeah. was it. Light bulb moment. That was it. That was it. 
That, mm-hmm. that, that, that was it. <laughs> see, see, listen, how, how did I know that? The moment she said, your sadness, I go, my mind goes back, oh man, we have this great relationship. That just gave it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I call her my warrior, okay? We want to make sure that our listeners are, can get in touch with this great gentleman who's providing us all this wonderful uh, information, and I love the analogies. Look, so, counseling that I didn't even know I needed. As we begin to close the show, we hope you enjoyed this episode and recommend subscribing so you don't miss out on anything new. I will uh, conclude by, again, uh, thanking uh, Dr. Francis uh, for for being with us today. Maybe we don't have to go to church tomorrow, huh? Um, (laughs) (laughs) Let me say, I thank you all for having me on. I, um, one thing that I promised myself, I will always have fun. So I'm just gonna cut it up and just go on with it. So I thank you, thank all three of you for having me on and, just text me, email me, or call me, and I'll be, I'll be right in. To reach our show, email L and Shay at prostatecancerrealtalk.com. That's E L and Shay, S H A Y, at prostatecancerrealtalk.com. Mm-hmm.